All right. So let's get ready for part two. All right. That's Thank okay. you. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, uh, welcome back. Uh, this is uh, part two. And as you can see, I can talk and talk about it. I hope uh, I'm not, uh, uh, I'm still uh, speaking about something you feel relevant uh, to, your, to your practice, to, you, to your use of Spark SQL. And I would appreciate if you could contact me uh, afterwards and say uh, something nice about my presentation and something not so nice that I can use to improve, to make uh, my presentations better, okay? So query execution pipeline. This is something I figure out you know, it's, it's like you are looking at something and you see, you feel that you understand, uh, you know, a concept, but it's only when you draw or when you, when you have a visual representation of, your, of this concept, you say, ah, that's so obvious. Why didn't they say it? Or why didn't they, they publish this, this uh, you know, this concept in, in this visual way? So, I apologize for lack of, you know, artistic s skills. Uh, you know, this is my way of uh, explaining what is query execution under the covers. And by the way, all these stages, all these phases are lazy vals in Scala. Once you touched one or two phases, all other phases before particular phase, let's say uh, optimized plan, are also touched and cached at Scala level, okay? It has nothing to do with uh, caching at, uh, you know, in Spark. It's just that this concept exists in uh, Scala where you can say, lazy val, please uh, initialize it at first uh, uh, touch and then keep it, okay? It has some impact on performance because there is this extra check, but still it's better than generating it over and over again. Especially that analyzes, all the phases are pretty uh, expensive. You can you can easily uh, imagine it. So Spark Analyzer. So uh, I had a conversation, a uh, few conversations with you guys, and one conversation revolved about around this analyzer and expressions. Uh, whether all expressions are resolvable or evaluable or not. There are some expressions that are not evaluable. Yeah, you know what I, what I want to say. So, so they will not generate any value while you, if you try to execute this particular expression, it's gonna throw an expression, uh, throw an er error. And this is just to mark something in your query plan that will get resolved or replaced by analyzer at analyzer's phase. If it was not replaced by something that is Evaluable, how can you pronounce it when you're discussing it? Okay, evaluable, uh, if it's not uh, replaced, then your query is wrong, okay? So this is just a simple check whether your query is okay or not. Just, just leaving at least one unavailable yeah, expression uh, will make your query uh, um, wrong, incorrect. So Spark Analyzer will validate logical query, query plans and make them proper for execution. So after you pass Spark Analyzer, your query will give you a result, okay? Will give you something. That's, that's uh, proof that your query is okay. And there, so, uh, as you can see, analyzer is nothing else like rule executor over or of logical plans. So it takes logical plan and gives another logical plan. We call this phase analysis. That's why we have rules that are um, particularly used for analysis. Okay? We could have other rules, and they say it in the code that they, I mean, Spark devs, that this rule should not be here because it, uh, you know, it would uh, better be in other places like optimization. But here is better because something. Okay? So, so. In general, analysis phase is just to validate your, uh, your query, okay? Making sure it's proper, okay? Okay, so, uh, and then there is an extension point uh, in Spark Analyzer that you can, uh, w which you can use to plug your own analysis rules, okay? Okay, so we've got this Catalyst Optimizer. You may have heard Catali Catalyst Optimizer many times before. This is something I cannot accept uh, hearing at uh, Spark Summit without this, um, without this disclaimer. This is the base of any optimizer, 
available in Spark SQL. So it's not a regular concrete class you can execute in Spark SQL. It's something that gives you the power of uh, optimizations uh, phase. And that, that's why I put this base uh, uh, between Catalyst and Optimizer. Yeah, it is Catalyst Optimizer. There is this concept. But um, as you will see, there is concrete Catalyst Optimizer, which Spark SQL uses. And there are, uh, by the way, two. Uh, one is for Hive, uh, Hive uh, oper queries, and another is for non-Hive operations. Okay. So Catalyst Query Optimizer, it's a base of query optimizers, uh, optimizes uh, logical plans and express and gives you optimized logical plan. It's another kind of uh, um, analyzer. Yeah, sorry for confusing you now, but because both are rule executors. They are accepting logical plan and give you logical plan back after they applied all the rules they defined. Okay? So again, it's processing your trees. Yes. Oh, very good question. The question is, uh, let me rephrase it. Uh, so the question was, uh, what's the difference between optimizer and analyzer, uh, specifically uh, whether analyzer rewrites your queries to a better shape, uh, or is this only validating your queries whether they are correct or not? Is this your question? OK, so yes, analyzer should only uh, check if your uh, query is proper or not, but there are some changes at analysis phase. Uh, one is to replace unavailable uh, operators or expressions with the available uh, counterparts. Okay, so there are some rewrites of your queries. Okay, right? Okay, so uh, that might be a little bit confused, uh, confusing, but again, you know, it's, it's often hard to say, okay, this is here, this is here. Sometimes it's much better to do stuff earlier in processing pipeline. That's how they de decided it. This is where you can, uh, uh, where you can find cost-based optimization. It's disabled by default. So uh, you need to enable it. Uh, by the way, uh, I did it uh, twice in my projects, and they were fine. But I ran into some issues with this CBO because it's not probably because it's not widely used yet. Uh, I'm not sure about uh, two four. Is it uh, going to be uh, enabled or not? I don't think so. Yeah, it's it's not uh, bulletproof yet, but still you can get uh, better performance, especially with joins, if you uh, enable your um, uh, queries and uh, turn this uh, cost-based optimization, okay, on. And then there is this uh, extended operator optimization rules. There is extension point you can use uh, by uh, uh, creating your own custom Spark optimizer. Uh, you don't have to do it uh, uh, since uh, two or three with this uh, uh, brand new uh, developer API, which I'm going to explain in a moment. Uh, next, uh, you've got the Spark Logical Optimizer. And I specifically say Logical Optimizer because there are two optimizers, even though they or Spark uh, speakers don't say it uh, explicitly. One optimizer is for logical plans, another optimizer is for physical plans. So there are two optimizations, but in uh, relational or database lingo, uh, there is only one uh, optimizer, and usually it's, it's logical optimizer. Um, or something I, I, I learned by studying uh, all the papers and, and code. So we've got the Spark logical optimizer. Uh, so this is a custom optimizer with its own extension points. Fine, OK? There is this uh, API, which might be um, confusing, exp external, uh, experimental methods. Uh, it, I haven't seen it uh, widely used, but it's available so you can plug your own custom rules uh, to a Spark session. Now we've got another API, so I think that these experimental methods will uh, disappear at some point. Uh, now these experimental methods and, and the brand new uh, API, they are pretty much about the same thing. Okay, about uh, uh, injecting new rules uh, for analyzer, optimizers, and okay, yeah, and, and uh, for the for the other for the brand new uh, also uh, relational entity uh, parser. 
OK, so Spark Planner. The last but not least in your uh, query execution pipeline, there is uh, Spark Planner. Spark Planner is, um, it, it extends uh, Spark strategies. It's just think about uh, another function that takes logical plan, optimized logical plan. It doesn't have to be optimized logical plan, by the way. It's just logical plan. So takes this logical plan and generates at least and now exactly one physical plan called Spark Plan. So in Scala, you will see Spark Plan class used uh, to express this executable uh, uh, plan. Okay, so uh, and there is this extension point uh, through experimental methods API. There is another uh, which I'm going to explain moment, uh, momentarily. Uh, we've got this uh, Spark Physical Optimizer, and this Physical Optimizer is uh, one of the two optimizers available in Spark SQL. Another is Logical Optimizer. Uh, they do pretty much the same thing. They take their own uh, trees, uh, logical uh, versus physical trees, and they process it to make your code, uh, your queries better. So uh, among the optimizations, or they call it preparations, uh, just to confuse me whenever I look at this code, it's like, why, why are they calling it preparations? Why are, why are they not uh, create, uh, created, uh, or why, they, why did they not uh, create a separate class just to say it's, you know, a physical optimizer? They didn't. But, so you've got this uh, plan subqueries, ensure requirements, something I'm going to explain tomorrow for bucketing. This is the place where bucketing uh, will kick in and all the information uh, Spark got from Hive Metastore about all the tables uh, for joins uh, and aggregations. Uh, to avoid uh, exchanges. Then collapse code gen stages. This is where code generation happens, uh, where you can see the star and code uh, generated. And reuse exchange and subqueries, OK? So and again, this is just another rule uh, working with Spark plans. So this is pretty basic, right? This is the slide. I added just before our talk, uh, my talk, uh, uh, so just before this presentation. So it's a brand new slide. If you've ever reviewed uh, the slides before, you uh, couldn't see this slide, OK? And this is about brand new stuff in 2.3.0. So uh, it's not available uh, before 2.3.0. Um, and this is called Spark Session Extensions. If I'm not mistaken, it was from Samir uh, who uh, contributed it. And this is the place where you can find, or where, where yeah, you can find, uh, you can plug or inject uh, um, your custom rules for analyzer, optimizer, optimizers, and also a relational entity parser, your custom rules, OK? It's much better now to play with all I shared with you, OK? So it's only before this talk I realized I missed this very important uh, information, because you may, you could have uh, asked yourself, why, why, am I, why do I need this, all this? You know, uh, I can understand my queries better, but OK, I want to make my queries better. So what can I do with, with all this knowledge? Now you know that while creating while you are creating your Spark session, you can inject your own custom rules and fix the bugs you reported and no one cared to fix in your uh, particular version. So given if you are using Spark 2.3.0 and on, uh, you can use this Spark session extensions. OK? And you know how to create Spark session. And you know why we need Spark session. This is the entry point to all Spark SQL processing. So you use Builder API, this uh, facade to create uh, Spark sessions. You may have zero or more Spark sessions. Yeah, some people get confused, especially thinking about Spark context. Yeah, now I got you confused. So, and then you use the uh, with extensions, uh, and this with extensions will allow you to uh, inject all the rules. You can also use this, uh, I think, undocumented uh, uh, property called uh, Spark SQL extensions. It's not, a, it's not a internal uh, property where you can define your. Uh, function one that accepts uh, um, Spark session, if I'm not mistaken, and give you uh, uh, this Spark session back. That's my understanding. I'm not sure about it. But anyway, there is this uh, property uh, you should explore. So this is uh, how to create, uh, how to use this Spark session extensions. Uh, you just uh, do Spark session.builder, 
to, uh, to access Builder API and this brand new and use this brand new method called with extensions. And through this with extensions, you can inject all the you know, a custom rules and a relational entity uh, parser uh, you ever uh, dreamt of. Uh, so, so rather than, you know, creating your own custom Spark, by the way, um, it's been, there were, there were times where I thought that Spark SQL is not a framework, it's a library and a framework for developers to use the API, but also to extend Spark to have a custom Spark build. Uh, it's, it's very dangerous to maintain your custom code, but often I was tempted to rewrite some code because the API was open and they clearly said, uh, if you um, uh, wanna be fancy, you can you know, create something uh, pretty crazy with this, with this, how to say, Spark SQL code, okay? Uh, now they gave you this uh, uh, interface so you can just uh, play with internals of uh, Spark SQL pipeline uh, much easier in a much more controllable way. Okay, yes. Yes. Oh, this is a very good question. By the way, this is a question not answered on Stack Overflow. So the question was, is there a way to override uh, uh, already existing uh, rules? Uh, is this your question? Uh, well, yeah, I think it's possible by programmatically changing what's already created for you, because uh, you will get this session uh, pre-processed. You shouldn't change it, so you are, you know, you are doing something uh, uh, undocumented. But I think it's possible to process all the uh, uh, code uh, prepared for you and change it uh, programmatically, but it's uh, it's not something uh, you should be uh, you, you should uh, it's not something recommended. Okay, uh, I know that there is a, um, there is a Jira for uh, disabling some rules. Uh, rules can be disabled by their own custom uh, properties, like uh, code code gen uh, collapse code gen. Uh, you can just disable code generation by disabling code gen. You can disable uh, buck bucketing support uh, and and others by internal or uh, public uh, properties. But uh, some rules are here and they are always executed. So yeah, to disabling them might not be easy, but I think it's doable. Okay, so you created your Spark session and then you can use it uh, whatever you like. Okay, so we are back to, to the days where RDD API was uh, the, 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 the best of Spark. Uh, we um, uh, didn't use uh, Spark SQL because it didn't exist at the time. And yes, I am saying, and I'm gonna repeat it again, you should stay away from RDD API as long as possible. You should stay away from dead products like Spark Streaming, even though there are some companies um, uh, who support it. I think that uh, you should embrace Spark SQL uh, as quickly as possible and all the goodies that come with, uh, with Spark SQL and avoid RDD APIs. You could beat uh, Spark SQL uh, sometimes, but I would hi highlight sometimes. You would spend m too much time uh, to, to fight, uh, uh, to, to make your query better, uh, better just to write your own custom query to uh, c generate this um, RDD um, code uh, better, okay? So anything, just, just if, if there is one thing you should remember after this talk, think about this. Spark SQL is nothing else like code generator using RDD API, okay? Eventually, you will get RDD API-based code because this is the only thing Spark understands. Spark, the core, the underlying infrastructure, you know, Spark core understands RDDs. And RDD is nothing else like a data abstraction to express your needs for distributed computa computation. Okay, so whenever you think about distributed computation, think about Spark, not because it's cool for big data, it's cool because it can take all the machines that are available in your cluster and, ex and execute something on top, 
okay? That's how they, uh, Spark Devs, uh, um, enable TensorFlow. That's my basic understanding of TensorFlow. Uh, TensorFlow um, on all the nodes that were available, okay? They, they simply executed all the processing on all the nodes. Uh, I think that's exactly how Python works, Spark, Python support works, where they pipe through pipe operation, they pipe the processing, the, the, the code, Python code, on all the executors that are running on your cluster. You don't have to think about how uh, many executors uh, will you have or should you have for your query. Spark will take care of it, okay, to some extent. You can, imp you can improve this uh, uh, by custom uh, configuration, but in general, think about Spark, Spark Core in particular, like general computing, uh, uh, general purpose computing platform, okay? API to express distributed computations. So why are we here and we discuss Spark SQL? Because Spark SQL takes this concept of distributed computations and gives you the power of uh, data frame, data set API with SQL languages, the language, okay? That's it. So rather than dealing with RDD API, you can use SQL. That's it. Okay, and what you need to know is that uh, RDD describes distributed computations, and this is distributed computation is described by RDD, which is not available at runtime. Remember it. You cannot discuss RDD uh, while discussing uh, uh, runtime or execution, okay? It's, it's only to do uh, or prepare for execution, okay? RDD describes how to execute uh, a distributed com computation, not uh, what to use, what machines to use, okay? Pretty much, because there is information about location uh, of your data, so, uh, yeah. But uh, think of it uh, like uh, RDD is just uh, partitions and compute method, that's it. And they, these partitions, uh, are in one-to-one -one relationship with tasks that are managed by task uh, uh, manager uh, that, uh, and, and that, that all together create stages. But this is law, you know, this is about RDD. So I added this slide just to remind you that RDDs are not available at runtime. They are going to be mapped by, you know, the uh, ingredients, the, the internals of Spark Core after Spark SQL generated this RDD-based code. And from RDD and partitions, after executing an action, you will get one or many stages with one or many tasks, okay? And knowing how many tasks you will end up with, with your, to execute your structured query is very, import, very, very important. So by default, Spark SQL uses 200 partitions and uh, for aggregations, right? And so think of many aggregations and joins, and you will end up with thousands of partitions. If you end up with thousands of partitions and Spark SQL cannot optimize the number of partitions, it can sometimes, but sometimes might not, uh, you will have to uh, repartition by expression or just repartition or just coalesce these partitions to make space on your cluster and make your um, query faster. So you need to know a little bit about this RDD, you know, um, basement uh, just to uh, fine tune your queries too, okay? Okay, so RDD lineage, uh, you can just look at the lineage and see all the, you know, stages and all the tasks, uh, that, all the partitions, and then calculate uh, how long a, a given query may take, okay? So it's not only about the size of the data, but also about how many tasks to execute. Spark will blindly execute all the tasks, even though all the tasks that are, that are defined, even though some tasks will do nothing, because there is nothing to process in, for a given partition. Okay, so if there, if there, if you have zero data partitions, 
you, you cannot expect, well, you may, there's this adaptive query execution, you may expect that Spark SQL will uh, uh, make sure that you will have as many or uh, as little uh, partitions as possible, so eventually you will get uh, exactly the number of tasks, but uh, it may not happen all the time, okay? So use to debug string to just explore uh, what's gonna be executed. Okay, and again, this is just uh, this, this uh, uh, nice looking diagram where I'm showing you that from here, from SQL and dataset, we end up with this RDD API based code that will eventually execute executed by Spark Core, by the infrastructure. Okay, so started queries to RDD, uh, we generate RDD and this is what's gonna be executed, okay? That's it, that's pretty much it, what you need to know. And think about RDD API like an assembler or JDM bytecode. Uh, by the way, it, it's pretty much uh, how Spark SQL uses this uh, RDD API. It, it, it generates this JDM bytecode uh, in whole stage code gen. Uh, and dataset API is like Scala or Python. It's a high level uh, language. You can always get lower if you want, if you're fancy. Okay, you can debug your query execution by using this uh, developer API by this implicitly available uh, API or interface by this uh, debug and debug code gen. So any data set, any data frame uh, will have access or has, ac have, has access to this uh, interface by saying Q debug or Q debug code gen, you will see the code uh, that was uh, generated for your structured query, okay? You may just uh, check it out in, in Spark SQL, in Spark Shell, and, and you know, review the code and, and see if you can make this uh, code better, okay? So remember, just access this uh, by doing this import or Apache Spark SQL execution dot debug dot underscore, you will enable this implicit conversion, or you can just ask any uh, structured query, any data set, data frame for query execution, and then access this interface through debug uh, uh, endpoint, okay, or uh, method. Okay, whole stage code generation is uh, one of the available optimizations. Uh, and this is just to generate Java code, and um, th there is this internal property, it's enabled uh, now, by default, it was not. Uh, so Spark SQL code gen whole stage, uh, you can disable it, don't do this. Uh, you cannot avoid all this code generation, uh, even though it, it, there is a way to disable it. No, it will break in some other places, so this, this ship will sink, <laughs> you know, eventually. So. Uh, if you, are, if you have problems with whole stage uh, Java code generation, like expression um, replacement, uh, uh, just report an issue. Uh, uh, don't fight uh, against this whole stage code gen. Just, just embrace it, okay? It's internal part of uh, Spark SQL now. Okay, so this is just uh, how you can uh, see if your uh, query got uh, transformed into executable Java uh, code. Uh, by seeing all the uh, whole stage code gen blocks, uh, you will see uh, what operators were taken together, were collapsed, and now are part of, part of one single uh, method call, okay? So uh, here you can just expect a, a pretty fast uh, uh, execution as compared to uh, you know, um, execution without this code generation. Yeah, two or three minutes more, yeah. And this is just uh, how it looks. Uh, and by the way, it took me a while to figure out how it really works. Uh, so I tried to explain it and I tried to draw a picture how it works because it's jumping from one place to another. Look at this. If you can see, uh, this is one of the reasons why you should uh, uh, be closer. Uh, so apply, conf whole stage enabled, it's always enabled, it's internal property, or it's, uh, it's uh, how to access it. And then th there is this re reset per query, and then uh, insert whole stage code gen. It jumps here, and this will check whether this particular operator supports code gen, and there are two ways to, to check it, which confuses me every time I see it. And once you figure out whether you, uh, there is support or not, uh, you may be again in insert whole stage code gen, keeping this stage ID, or you will jump to insert input adapter, which you, you uh, enable another, another uh, physical operator. And what I asked uh, um, uh, the, the, the other day, 
was, can I, uh, can I assume that now physical operators are only to have do produce and do consume methods, which are part of this whole stage code gen? And I was uh, uh, corrected by Herman, uh, um, who said uh, I should not, because do produce is the main interface to any Spark plan, any physical operator, with do produce and do consume supporting uh, whole stage code gen, which, by the way, is enabled by default, but still. OK. But anyway, this is, uh, I'm, I'm digressing. So uh, tungsten execution backend is the, the, the last uh, topic I wanted to cover. It's just to say that uh, all your data it goes through another pipeline to make sure that uh, Spark SQL uses as little memory as possible. So uh, your data will get transformed into or mapped into internal representation, internal row. And Spark SQL uses tungsten under the covers to uh, lay out the data. So ev effectively, you can think of uh, Spark SQL as a kind of like memory manager. Well, there is memory manager. And this memory manager, um, so Spark SQL manages its own memory, so it's kind of like a separate GC on your, in your application. OK, and that's it from me. So we've got one more minute uh, and time for questions. So thank you all for having me. Applause, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Let's take questions offline um, because we need to get set up for the oh next yeah. speaker. But yeah, find Jacek down here. Sure. So, yeah, yeah, thank you. <laughs>